Whatever happened to predictability, the milkman, the paperboy, and evening TV? There's something so welcoming and familiar about a well-crafted TV theme song. As a wise Bostonian once said, sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. While the sitcom theme song has become far less important in a modern competitive media landscape, it's an art form that deserves greater appreciation. And to that end, the great pop culture debate is trying to crown the best sitcom theme song of all time, Call Fred Flintstone because we're going to have a gay old time. <laughs> Believe it or not, I'm talking on air. I never thought I could feel so gassy. I'm your host, Eric Resniak, but I can't do this all on my own. I'm no Superman. Please welcome up my amazing panel. It's the most sensational, inspirational, celebrational, muppetational Ama Marfo. Let's start the music. Let's light the lights. Let's do it. Welcome to the show, Ama. Who can turn the world on with a smile? It's Dan Howell. Oh, you know, I checked my local listings and I still don't know if I have my DVR set right. Oh, well, you really do suddenly make it all seem worthwhile. And she's the lady in red when everybody else is wearing tan. Please welcome back Kate Reculia. I'm just a flashy girl from Syracuse. I don't think you can be flashy (laughs) and from Syracuse. (laughs) And I say that as someone who is. All right. So before we dive into the debate, let's go over how this all works. We made a list of every memorable sitcom theme song we could think of from the Dick Van Dyke show through to the Big Bang Theory. We had more than 100 people take the survey to pick their favorites, and the top 32 vote getters were ranked by popularity, added to a bracket, and our panelists have made their decisions. Now we argue about it and insult each other all for your amusement. If you want to follow along at home, you can find all the brackets, including the one for this episode, at greatpopculturedebate.com. Make a copy for yourself, fill it out, like Laverne and Shirley, do it your way, and then compare it to our panelists' picks. Think we're way off base? Drop a comment on this episode on the website, or be like my mom and yell at me on social media. So before we get into the actual debates, we're going to go over the unanimous winners for round one. Picture it. Number one seed, The Golden Girls, shredded eight seed, The Office. One seed, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, demoted eight seed, Charles in Charge. Three seed, Mary Tyler Moore, evicted six seed, Three's Company. One seed, Friends, outrocked the Cleveland Rocks theme for The Drew Carey Show. Quick sidebar, I was surprised that that was the Drew Carey one that made it in. I find it the least charming of their three themes, but that's fine. Three seed, The Jeffersons, finally got their piece of the pie over six seed, Happy Days. And I just adore a penthouse view, but two seed, The Muppet Show, left seven seed green acres in the menorah pile finally one seed gilligan's island capsized eight seed married with children and with that we're on to the actual debates three quarter of our panel picked the flintstones over 70 swinger welcome back cotter ama you were the one down with mr cot's hair why so this was a really challenging one for me because i very quickly realized that it was going to be are you voting for the one that is the best song from a compositional standpoint versus the one that means the most to you. So I love the Flintstones grew up with it was a really big fan. But when I thought about like, what was a better song, I think there's something jazzier, catchier to welcome back Cotter. Yeah. And that's a really great point because everyone brings a different kind of rubric to this for their choices. And there is no doubt. Welcome back. Cotter is a great song. It's super catchy. It's brilliantly arranged. It tells you everything you need to know about that show, but it stands on its own. As it's as a as an actual single, like I believe it was a popular radio song at the time. I think it was, yeah, yeah. Um, so I fully hear that, Dan. Why did you go with the Flintstones? So the the Flintstones is you know it's one of those theme songs that everybody knows it. Um, it is iconic. It became a jazz standard um, after the Flintstones aired um, on TV. It helped Flintstones become one of the most highest rate, most highest, oy vey, the <laughs> highest rated um, animated primetime sitcoms ever. And, I, you know, it, it's it got that big band score to it. It, again, it's one of those, it lays out the Flintstones world in bedrock. Um, and it, it just, it's a, it's such a great, happy introduction into this modernized caveman life. And I, and I, and I love it. Yeah. And I mean, without the Flintstones and the success of this song, would we have Pebble cereal and would we have Flintstones chewable vitamins? It's true. These are the it's questions true. That I need to have answered. And would we have a version done by the B-52s? Mm, there is a version of this song done by the B-52s? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They read. They did the uh, the theme for the Flintstones movie. 
Yeah, for the live action one from '94, I want to say. Uh-huh. Yeah. And it does have to do with my choice, but man, I love the live action Flintstones. Like, if it is on TV, I will watch it. I will talk the whole. I know all of it. Ugh. Yeah, it's so good. Was so it good. Rosie O'Donnell, Betty Ruppel? Yes, that, yes she, she sure is. is. Haley Berry's in it. Kyle McLaughlin. Ah, Rick Moranis. Come on. One of the last times we saw Rick Moranis. Yeah. 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 Seriously. Um, well, there we go. So uh, we have Dan, myself, and Kate with the Flintstones. Is anybody changing their mind on that? No. Welcome back, Cotter is a jam, but the it's Flintstones is yeah. iconic. <laughs> yeah. I, I, Amar, are you stick, sticking with Mr. Cotter? <laughs> I can be pulled over to the other side. I can. You don't have to. It, it's completely <laughs> fine to be like, I am standing my ground. We're still going to advance the Flintstones, but you can say, on principle, I'm sticking with Mr. Welcome Back, Cotter and an early performance by uh, our own Danny Zoo. No, I'm, I'm going to allow myself to be swayed here and dig my heels in elsewhere. <laughs> All right. So we are have a unanimous uh, victory for the Flintstones. Moving on, 75% of our panel also preferred three seed cheers over six seed the love boat. I will gladly throw on my life preserver and go down with this ship. But before I do that, Kate, why cheers? Uh, cheers. So I did, I did a little research. Um, cheers was actually named... <laughs> Um, by I think TV Guide maybe t- 2011 as the greatest sitcom theme of all time. Um, mm. So it has that like laurel. <laughs> is it a laurel? <laughs> I'm not sure what it is going into this, <laughs> but it is, it's just like so. My rubric for picking the best songs was: is the song itself like compositionally? It does it. Is it a good song? Um, how has it? Uh, affected pop culture, been a part of cult- pop culture? What kind of legs does it have? And h- how good is it at distilling a particular essence of whatever it is, you know, um, whatever the show is? And Cheers is just all three of those things. It's a good, it's a funny song. Although in listening to the lyrics, there's like like a little wee transphobia in it. Like, <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah. The oh, second yeah. verse is totally oh. transphobic. Yeah, it was like, wow, okay, all right. Okie doke, that's great. Um, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, but if we're just taking the part that's like in the credits of the song itself it's funny lyrics it's it's this great kind of like you want to go to the place where everyone knows your name where everyone's troubles are all the same let's just go to this watering hole in boston um this place where everyone comes from some other kind of life and finds community together which is really what the show is about um yeah and get Cheers. fucked up on a nightly basis they sure do they sure do that's right a great show about alcoholism um <laughs> you know, but i mean of the four people on this podcast three either have or currently live in boston so <laughs> i get it and i'm not gonna win this I know, one no no <laughs> i'm very comfortable with that but i will say this about the love boat theme song first of all there was some debate as to whether or not the love boat even counts as a sitcom and i hear that in my opinion it does like none of that was played serious like it was all (laughs) bottom of the barrel famous people looking for an easy paycheck and um, (laughs) they interacted by being kind of low grade sluts for an hour a week like it was fine um but the theme song is a jam it is a bop you throw that sucker on you pop a quaalude and you twirl twirl in your apartment (laughs) the love boat has it going on like can't you just see yourself doing that and i really i think i was born like two decades too late because i would (laughs) have i I would not have survived the 70s but i also would have had a great time would have had an amazing time eric an amazing time um but like I can't hear the song and not imagine Z listers with their names popping up in a porthole. <laughs> yes. Charles Nelson Riley, Pizadora, Charo, Charo again. She just sleeps under the chafing dishes in the buffet. <laughs> it is very evocative to me. And for that reason, I, I will always cherish it, but I relent and I, I am completely fine moving. Cheers. To that <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to change my vote, but I am going to say, what song do I occasionally just sing to my cats? It is the love boat theme. <laughs> exactly. There's <laughs> your food. It's the same I gave you yesterday. Like, it's just, you can apply it to everything. Oh, yeah. You're presenting someone majestic. I mean, should I they enjoy it? As much as I can enjoy anything, really. Yes, it's yeah. true. <laughs> and they enjoyed it like we enjoy Charo every fucking week. Like, <laughs> it's not exciting, nor is it new, but it's there. <laughs> 
Okay. <laughs> so moving on. Schlemiel, Schlemazel, Haas and Pfeffer Incorporated. Three quarters of us preferred two seed Laverne and Shirley, while Kate preferred the bracket suicide is indeed painless <laughs> by championing two seed mash. So Kate... <laughs> Where were you going with that? Okay, so again, this is something that I will very happily let the theme from Laverne and Shirley trounce this, but I couldn't not speak for MASH. Um, It is one of, I think it's the only purely instrumental theme that made it to the bracket, which Patreon listeners can go and listen to our warm-up show and and hear hear Emma talk about the the (laughs) instrumental that didn't make it. (laughs) Nicely Um, done. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I've lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> it is a great instrumental. It's a great instrumental song. But it is, it's also, so in, in doing some research too, it is the theme from the movie that Robert Altman directed about MASH that came out, I think, in the early 70s that the TV show is an adaptation from that was written for a specific scene um, that like, it's like there's a like a mock last supper at the MASH like encampment. Um, and he had to give it to this one character to sing where, where someone's like doing like a faux suicide. Real happy stuff. Yeah. Oh, my. He like, he like, Robert Altman couldn't write the lyrics. So like his son, Mike, who was 14, wrote it. And I was like, yes, a 14 year old can definitely write Suicide is Painless and I can take Whoa. or leave it in the end, right? But it's it's such a it's such a haunting song. And I think MASH is such an incredible TV show too, because it is like a like one of the earliest dramedies, right? Like it's sure. very funny, but it's also extremely sad. And ultimately it's about the waste and the absurdity of war, right? And I like especially when you're talking about sitcoms or when you're talking about comedy in general, I always respond more to comedy that earns the laughs because it also looks at the dark and Mm -hmm. mash definitely did that. And you can look at mash and say that like, because of mash, we have um, glow. (laughs) Like, Like it's that same kind of it's, it's so sad, but it's also so funny. And that ends up making it feel really alive. And I feel like Suicide is Painless as this haunting theme that tells you there's something deeper going on in the show other than just like the situation that's funny um, is really is, is pushing the genre of TV storytelling forward. So mesh. <laughs> that's a great argument. Thank and you. I am pleased that it made the bracket because it is an iconic song and it deserves to be discussed. Um but Amma, I'm hoping you can take our energy level back up from this <laughs> very bleak foxhole that we found ourselves and talk to me about Penny Marshall goofing off in a beer factory. <laughs> I need to go there. I need to go there right now. Exactly. And I think that's a big part of it is, again, first going back to the argument that I made for Welcome Back, Cotter versus the Flintstones, the idea of when I was in the heyday of watching those shows – which one kind of gave me that better feeling. And I think Laverne and Shirley in a number of ways for someone who's nine, 10 years old, like, yeah, I'm going to get Laverne and Shirley and not fully understand why MASH is funny. Mm -hmm. And I mean, 20 years later, I've come back around on why both of them work. But I think that Laverne and Shirley is just one of those classic ones where you have a really good feeling watching that show, getting to that theme song, seeing all the situations that came in. And there's also a little bit of a hashtag justice for happy days piece of this because it's not represented. And like that whole class of shows that Gary Marshall, Penny Marshall did together. So happy days, Laverne and Shirley, even Mork and Mindy, um, all of those, just that feeling that it gives you when you're about to jump into an episode that kind of carried Laverne and Shirley over mash for me. Yeah, and I, I'm th- I'm glad that you brought up that because that whole kind of uh, collection of shows, there's a real wonderful brightness to those theme songs. I would argue that like, as much as I love my 80 Schmaltz theme songs, and we'll get into those later. Um, right before we got to that, there was that really. I think it's like the the pinnacle of great theme song writing, which is it's impactful it's bright it actually references what's going on in the show but not in a way that's super narrative like the way the 60s did um i i think it's great so I agree fully on laverne and shirley we is anyone going to change their vote to mash dan i'm 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 sticking with the girls <laughs> sticking with the girls so we're going to advance laverne and shirley onto round two uh we were surprisingly deadlocked between four seed full house and five seed unbreakable kimmy schmidt Dan, why Kimmy? Uh, so the theme song to Kimmy Schmidt, um, I did, uh, you know, again, working on this episode, I <clears throat> uh, did my research and I, again, love Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. Um, I was a fan of Full House at the time when it was on. I was much 
you know, I was, I was a kid when it was on and I thought it was great. Um, I, I don't have the same appreciation for it as an adult as I did as a kid, but Kimmy Schmidt. So the, the, the melody, um, and the lyrics were written by Jeff Richmond, um, who is Tina Fey's husband. Um, who also wrote the theme to 30 Rock. And they took his melody and lyrics, gave it to the Gregory Brothers, who are the duo uh, trio, I can't remember how many of them are, who like basically invented songifying um, songs from the news on YouTube. Um, they did Bedroom Intruder. They did the Double Rainbow song. They did Winning with Charlie Sheen. Um, they like brought that songification to the forefront. And you know, it's so iconic of that period of time when it seemed like everything was being songified to a point where no one wants anything to be songified anymore. But it, it also is applicable to the story of these women escaping a cult um, that was underground in a bunker. And, you know, they, they knew from the get go, they wanted this to be the theme song to the show because it's so relatable to the content that then even later on in the series, the guy that's interviewed at the beginning, his character comes back and, you know, he's like risen to fame and has fallen back into obscurity and they bring him back to talk about the impact that's had on his life um, and talks to Titus Burgess's character about how, you know, you shouldn't just chase easy fame because you're going to go and you're going to drop back down again. Your 15 minutes aren't what you expect. You know, and I thought that was so great that they they literally connected their theme song to a plot line in their story, which is fascinating. It's also so damn catchy. Like, <laughs> I sing it all the time because it's constantly stuck in my head. Um, I just think I think it's just a it's a really solid representation of a show and a time period even though it was like five years ago. Um, I can tell that you want to uh, add something here. I do. Um, so in addition to that kind of it being very much a snapshot of the point in time that it takes place, um, there's like a slight little nudge to it in the interactive special on Netflix, which is like the final chapter of it, wherein um, if you do go to skip it, Walter Bankston, the character, like pops up and is like, you want to skip it? It's going to be longer and you get an extended version of it. Oh. <laughs> That's amazing. It's delightful. Like, I don't want to give away any of, like, the additional twists and turns, but that's one that I encourage people to pop up and try to just say, like, go ahead and click that. It is an option, and it does something incredibly cool, but it's just, it is. It's such a joyful song. It's such a fun one. It does connect directly into the story, and it's just... Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. So I'm going to fully affirm Dan's decision here. Okay, so this is really interesting. I'm going to speak on Full House, but um, I, you guys have actually done a very good job swaying I know. on this one. I'm extremely um, swayable for this whole show. Just <laughs> <high>. <laughs> um, that said, I am going to speak to Full House because, as I mentioned it a few minutes ago, the 80s sitcom Schmaltz is 100% like my kiddie pool. I love it. That was... Like, <laughs> That TGIF, like the synth and the saxophones and the like, the 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 wailing guitars, and it was like it was a lot of energy, right? For, for, for really very small stories. It's like, Bam! <laughs> We're eating in a picnic in a park. Yeah, it was very very intense. Um, but I do think that the Full House song is actually of those that area one of the better ones and it, it's it, the voice on it is good it's it's recognizable you can't help but sing along with it and this is not really a relevant issue but I'm going to bring it up Carly Rae Jepsen does an excellent cover of this for <laughs> Fuller House which How I How is that not relevant? Because <laughs> it's not the same th so show but okay. like her, her Carly Rae Jepsen is always relevant I just want to give you that permission but please continue. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's really all I have on that one I am completely fine with us moving Kimmy Schmidt forward and I will sway my vote. Kate, uh, Kate what do you think on that? Um, I'm also going to swing my vote. That was an extremely compelling argument. And and it is really the only, when I think of like sitcom themes, it is literally the only sitcom word theme, like lyrical theme that I can call to mind of the last like decade, like specifically. That's a great point. Like, in a time when we're getting fewer and fewer theme songs, it yeah. not really stands out as the only one, but it's, it's like an all caps, like we have a theme song and that, so if it's an art form you appreciate, there is that additional point that they not only didn't cop out of making one, but they really went for it. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. It's a it's an excellent point. So there you go, folks. We have our first big swing of Woo! the uh of the bracket. We are going to grab the Ouija board and we're gonna summon Nell Carter because we need a break. <laughs> so we will be right back with the rest of round one after a word from these sponsors if someone bothered to buy the ad space, but we will be right back. <laughs> Hey, Kate. Hey, Eric. So I heard, and this may be true, that you were actually the Great Pop Culture Debate's very first Patreon subscriber. (gasps) Was I? You were. You're not only a panelist, you're also a founder. Also a founder. I mean, it does give me a feeling of joy to contribute towards high quality podcasts like the Great Pop Culture Debate so that, you know, like I get swag. Yeah. What kind of swag do you get? Um, You get a button. That's the one I signed up for. Is there a tote? I feel like there should be a tote. (laughs) There's not a tote yet, but that's a great idea. I have some other ideas that I'm working on. You get access to things early. You get access to Patreon only little mini-sodes. You get to hear the warm-ups before when everyone's just kind of getting their little sea legs before they get into the main the main attraction and you get season zero you get season zero it's exactly right you will never hear the otherwise folks and there's some great episodes in that which include best madonna single best rupaul's drag race lip sync best uh 90s cartoon and the only way you can hear those is by getting a patreon sponsorship with for as low as two dollars a month then you even get season zero just for that. So so thank you very much, Kate. Uh, we appreciate all of our Patreon sponsors. And if you do have the interest, please go to patreon.com backslash great pop culture debates and support us. Welcome back. Continuing with round one, you take the good, you take the bad, you take them both, and then you have me getting my ass kicked by supporting two seed The Facts of Life (laughs) over seven seed Greatest American Hero, which was supported by literally everyone else. Kate, why should I believe it or not? Uh, So this actually, this is kind of a funny personal story. Maybe it's not even funny. I don't know. I remember my mother had sheet music for the piano to the great American hero that I remember being like just fascinated that I was like, what is this show? I've never heard of the show. It's so good. It has its own sheet music that my mother plays on the piano. And it's I mean, it's kind of it doesn't fit all of the things of my rubric right because like I've never seen the great American hero I have no idea whether or not this song conveys some essential um, innate truth about the show I expect it does it does it doesn't seem too does. complicated um but it is also it's a it's a jam like it's just a really catchy song it's very clever it's an inversion it's it's sort of um a satirical cute commentary on the idea of being a hero and being this great american like force for justice he's sort of like he was carrie's prom date and he's this like dude with like very curly hair who's kind of it, they should have picked somebody else right like i believe it or not it's me i'm the hero and there's there's a lesson to be had in all of that. Be the hero of your own story, America. Aw, that's America. very sweet. And I will say this. <laughs> um, it was not a big hit. It was a short-lived show. Yeah. And the But the, the song, uh, the song charted. It was like number two on wait, hold on. I also pulled this up. On the adult contemporary chart, believe it or not, went to number three. Uh, it was number two on the Billboard Hot, Hot 100 in 1981. Uh, do you want to guess the song that kept it out of the top spot? It was 1981? Yeah. Was it Queen of Hearts by Juice Newton? No, it was Endless Love by Diana Ross and Lionel Richie. Uh, I but can't still, about that. Like, are there any other themes other than, you know, we'll get to there, the Ren's Frey <laughs> that made it, that charted like the song. And also, believe it or not, George isn't at home. Like, that's an important pop culture. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, the, a couple other songs did chart actually. Welcome back, Cotter definitely oh, it did. did, and I think Golden Girls did too, but not the version on the show, the original, the right. songwriter yeah. version. But we're we're getting off track. Like, uh, the, here's the thing, folks. I know that I went for um, Facts of Life instead of this, but I love Greatest American Hero theme song. I've mm-hmm. always loved it. I actually remember watching that show when I was a kid. Didn't you sing it? You yes. S- yeah, I did. It is one of my go-to karaoke songs. That's- it is fucking amazing. <laughs> And so I am I not mad that. about this one advancing at all. Look at what's happened to me. I can't believe it myself. <laughs> but um, 
I will speak on behalf of the uh, Facts of Life because that is my job. Um, and what I want to say is, girls, girls, girls. <laughs> Honestly, the theme song is the best part of the Facts of Life. It is a solid sitcom and I love it. And, you know, uh, Blair's hair also is the other great part of that show. But um, the song is fucking great. And we can sit there and we can uh, ch- talk about how amazing The Greatest American Hero is because it is. But this is a great sitcom theme song. And it also changed over time. The, uh, the first season of Facts and Life is very different from the other ones. Like half the cast isn't there. They retooled the theme song, etc. It's written by Alan Thicke and Gloria Lowe. What? Like, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Solid. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. They were a song, a theme song power couple in the 80s. They wrote a bunch of them, including they Growing Pain. There's, yeah, they did a few. There's a novel. Yeah, they were everywhere. There's a novel right there. A theme song power There's couple. There's totally. <laughs> there is. And then wow. they divorced, of course. And what is the, the end game for all this? Robin fucking thick and blurred lines. Uh, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, <laughs> I consider the two of them to be like the Norman Lear of sitcom theme songs from the 80s and I do think we'd be doing a disservice to the genre and to the show by not at least talking about how great it is a catchy theme song it's got a great patter to it it's energetic it does a great job describing the show but all that said, Greatest American Hero is kind of its own little supernova, really and I'm is. not at all mad about it advancing. So does anyone object to it going to round two? Nope. Not I. Nope. Damn. All right, good. So we're going to move it on. Uh, I'm hosting a theme song podcast in Forest Hills, Queens, and my panelists kicked out the nanny in one of those crushing scenes. I will define five. I will defend 5C the nanny named Fran, while Ama speaks on 4C the Simpsons, which currently has three quarters of our votes. Ama, go for it. Okay, so to inform this decision, I should also say that loving TV theme songs, I also love film scores. Um, That's a really big part of the type of music I enjoy. So the idea that this silly show that's kind of for kids, kind of for adults, got Danny Elfman to do the music, and it's so emblematic of the type of music that he does, um, felt really exciting to me. And I think it's one of those things that as soon as you hear it, you know exactly what it's referring to, which the nanny has that as well. But I really love just the sound that it kind of identifies with the show and it runs all the way through. And even after so many years, you just kind of hear that song and you know exactly what's coming. And yet they've also managed to innovate on it a little bit. So there are a number of different versions. They had a Game of Thrones crossover version of it. So it's a really versatile song in its own right. So I'm going to fight for the uh, film score nerd in me and say Simpsons has got to take this one yeah and again this is one of those where I'm completely content with it with me losing because the Simpsons like we use throw on the word iconic a lot like a lot I do especially but the Simpsons is fucking iconic and the, the best part about it is when Danny Elfman wrote that he thought it was a throwaway that nobody would ever hear because he's like no one is going to watch this stupid show yeah and now it's what how many is oh my it- god I think they're in season 31. I want yeah. to say season 31, but like if you classify it as a sk- sitcom, which for the purposes we do, it's the longest running sitcom on television. Yeah. Absolutely. And like, I don't know how it doesn't advance, except that I'm an idiot and I put the nanny in front of it. But <laughs> here's why. Um, I think it has an absolutely fabulous swing beat to it. It's got a great little jazzy delivery, fantastic harmonies. It's very sweet ad lines and some super smart lyrics. Like the whole rat a tat tat introduction and then like she had style, she had flair, she was there. It perfectly encapsulates this sweet little show that like came out of nowhere and was actually very popular for a few years. So um, I think the nanny is a great uh, theme. I think it's a great opening credit sequence, which is its own separate bracket, which I, th- I hope you will get to at some point. Ooh, yes. Um, Vote for oh, it, Patreon yeah. people. Request that, exactly. Patreon people. <laughs> Vote for that, guys. Yeah. But all of that being said, I'm completely content with The Simpsons moving forward. It's a juggernaut, and I don't know how you can get it out. So um, this is, I will also be out on my fanny along with uh with with Nanny Fran, but frankly, on my fanny is where I do my best work. So we will be moving on. <laughs> you know, uh, go ahead, Kate. I was just gonna say it's funny when I was like, yeah, I think that you know, suicide is painless is the only instrumental because like I, the Simpsons is in like another league in terms of what songs are, right? TV, oh, yeah. I didn't even consider yeah. it. Like, <laughs> yeah, like it has words at the very beginning, so it's that's true. Yeah, yeah that's it has. True. It has been name of the show, and that is what disqualifies it as being an instrumental. But this is the closest that you get to that, which I think is why I feel so strongly like this has to go through. 
And like even the 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 words in it are kind of like the word of God announcing yeah. Yeah. the show. Like it's it's really a, a kind of an amazing work of art. Um all right, moving on. I'm in detention again for championing five seeds saved by the bell over four seed all in the family. Dan, why did you pick the white people 2020 anthem? <laughs> Those were the days. <laughs> oh my god, yes. Yeah. Um, so I think <laughs> that would work so well with um, the theme to All in the Family, which is titled Those Were the Days, um, is, you know, the, 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 the show is so known for Archie Bunker being, you know, quote unquote, a lovable bigot, which is like a terrible term that we, no one should probably ever use because a bigot's a bigot. Um, but it it's so the show is actually the opposite of what the characters portray where that's not, you know, that's not the, the stories they were trying to tell. They were trying to show that, you know, that train of thought doesn't work. So that the, the theme song is so on the nose about like, Oh, we miss those days, even though like they're, they're really kind of describing like they weren't great. They, you know, it's not like we were trying to make America great again. Um, it's, you know, it, it, they're really highlighting that, we have to progress forward and we need to, to, to move on from old ways of thinking. Um, Cause I mean, realistically the actors in the show were all incredibly liberal. Um, and uh, you know, and as I was doing research for this episode, uh, I had no idea who was responsible for writing this song. So the team that wrote it, uh, Lee Adams and Charles Strauss are the team that wrote the music and lyrics to the musical Bye Bye Birdie, which blew my mind. Yeah, and Charles Strauss wrote the music for Annie, what? which oh. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, they're pretty good at what they have, like Tony Awards. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So, you know, and it's it's just, I mean, it's it, again, it's just to use the word iconic. Um, it's one of those songs and show openers that are instantly recognizable. Um, you know, it's been spoofed um, and reused on multiple other sitcoms. It's basically the opening of Family Guy is the same principle. Um, and we get to live in a world where Woody Harrelson and Marissa Tomei got to do a version of it on the All in the Family Live special that aired last year, which was <laughs> amazing because I always want uh, Marissa Tomei to play Gene Stapleton's characters from now on. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's one of those where, I again, I feel like it was so indicative of the time. And while not you know, as directly connected to this, the plot of the show really set up what the show was setting out to do. Yeah. The, that's great argument again. And here's the thing, folks, I'm not even going to debate this one that hard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just pick say by the bell because I'm hoping that Mark Paul Gosselaar will drop that restraining order. It's, <laughs> It's fine for a like a teenage comedy. It's really it's set in the 1990s. It's exactly what it needs to be, including like the background graphics with like purple lightning bolts and a guitar and a palm tree, right? Um, it is exactly what it's supposed to be. It's fully serviceable, but it's up against what is iconic. Mm -hmm. Like we again, we use that word a lot, but there's a reason that when I put up the poll for this, I used all in the family as the photo for it. Because when you're thinking of sitcom theme songs, mm. that is yeah. to me like one of the chief examples of a theme song that perfectly sets the stage for what it's doing. So here I am defending the opposite choice again. Um, <laughs> that's what makes that's I'm, what makes good podcast content, Eric. <laughs> sure. Let's go with that. It definitely isn't me being drunk. Um so <laughs> it sounds like we are moving those were the days slash uh all on the family on to round two and next we're gonna throw it old school as three quarters of us gave three seed the adams family all the snaps while emma said hey hey i'm with the monkeys so i'm a white so we were a monsters household which i think is the primary Reason. <laughs> sure. It's like the sharks and jets of 1950s TV or Nick at Night. I get it. Exactly. Exactly. Like you have the option of both, and we were a Munster's house. <laughs> <laughs> and like, even as I was prepared to defend this one, a quote from a different fictional 
like kind of 60s group the wonders came up where there's a scene in that thing you do where lenny is yelling at jimmy as he's walking away and he's like now he's off to write that hit song alone in my principle and i'm okay being alone on this one because I think it, again it's just a great song like it's one of those ones that again i think to the few others that have charted like it was a song on the charts as were many monkey songs um and it kind of transcended the space that it was in whereas the adams family while recognizable um people kind of get the idea of it and it's since been remade several times including the recent animated one which is not really particularly good but it does make oscar isaac and nick kroll brothers which great here for it um yeah i think and just kind of going back to the iconography of it versus the song i think the monkeys is a better song so that was what made me stand in my, alone in my principles on this one. Fair. Kate, why the Adams family? Well, uh, I have a cat named Gomez. <laughs> so, uh, amazing. It's over. But so so it is, it is um it's such a catchy song. It's such a such a fun, clever orchestration. The the organ, the finger snaps, the da 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 like you know you know what that is like that is woven into the fabric of like ooky spooky macabre tv that is like you know many people know it but here's the thing i am eminently swayable (laughs) (laughs) and i made a really good argument that the monkeys hey hey we're the monkeys is a much better song (laughs) it just is it's a better song it's a better song Wow, I did a terrible job. Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. I, I, I will say that um, I agree that the mon- the Hey Hey Where the Monkeys is a better song and it's super catchy. But if we're talking about sitcom theme songs, I do think that the Adams Family does a better job in like leading us into what the world the is. Show. Yeah, what the world, the world is, is mm-hmm, mm-hmm, as mm-hmm. opposed to the monkeys. But I'm leading the witness, so I'm gonna. So Ama, you're sticking with the monkeys. Heels dug in. <laughs> Dan, <laughs> so, so, th- so this this was a tough one because um, again, I love the monkeys, I love the show, I love the band, but again, as theme songs go, I think the Adams Family just carries a little more weight behind it, and okay, and I love the theme to the monkeys because again, it's one of those you know what you're getting. Everyone at some point in time on some like high school music trip has done the monkeys walk with three of their friends. But I think the Adams Family, it's just, I don't know. I, I feel like, it, it, again, as Eric said, I think it just it, it leads you into the world and the show. Sticking Kate, with are you. All right, Kate, are you going to stick with the Adams Family? You know, I am. I am. My cat is looking at me right now. Exactly. He's <laughs> judging me. He's a tuxedo. He's <laughs> always dressed for dinner. Caramia. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so we are advancing the Adams Family. Thank you, Gomez, for being our unofficial fifth vote. <laughs> And then finally, in round one, three quarters of us were gridlocked in favor of two seed the Brady Bunch, while Amma was tuned into WKRP in Cincinnati. Amma, why did you go that? So way? I'm writing the second verse of Alone in My Principles on this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, I think it, it's a better song. Like I get that the Brady Bunch theme song does something very specific, and it, arguably, if you were to go to anybody that had barely watched TV and say, "Name a TV theme song," this is one of the ones that they're probably most likely to be able to name but i think for this particular part of the process i kind of leaned on if i were to just listen to a song i like the wkrp song better i I can't argue with that and i will say that when i put this first up someone who's a a fan of the pop uh, pop culture podcast said to me eric what are you doing you've betrayed lonnie anderson where's wkrp in cincinnati and i'm like it's on there gabe and it was like (laughs) it is such a um of such a good song that literally within minutes or people are like, Hey, dum dum, you didn't include it. So that's how uh, a, a good of a song that it is. Kate, can you defend the Brady Bunch? I mean, it's here. So this is going to be a, an interesting defense too, because like, I don't really like the Brady Bunch. I don't really like the song, but like to Hama's point, like if you, if anyone is remotely aware of the idea of television and syndicated television and you ask them, give me a TV theme song, they'll be like, I've got a story of a pretty lady right it's the lady first right yeah anyway yeah <laughs> like it's such a it, it hits all those things right like the song itself is catchy the song itself is inane and it sets you up for an inane tv show right <laughs> like, sorry That's sorry, great right? so, sorry brady lovers it's inane <laughs> and, and it's just like it, its prominence in pop culture as a theme song as a sitcom theme song is just totally undeniable so yeah, I think that's that's my argument is and and I'm looking forward to it getting knocked out in the next round. 
<laughs> Honestly, same like T, but, uh, and I think you really just kind of nailed it on the head. Like even now when we're recording this still during pandemic 2020, most of us are still doing zoom calls every yes, fucking yes. zoom meeting. So I'm like, Oh my God, you guys were the Brady bunch. Like, <laughs> Brady it, bunch. It, yeah. It's, it's so, so omnipresent. It is a universal constant. The Brady Bunch song has pervaded every like area of our society. And that show hasn't been on the air in 50 years. But oh we God. still know it. We still recognize the song. So for that reason, I put it over WKRP, which is a great song. In fact, all the 70 songs on this uh, bracket are really great. And Dan, who's on here, has done a wonderful job putting together a Spotify playlist of all these. We'll put it on the website so you can go through and listen to them yourself. Um, I also made a YouTube playlist of all the credits so that you can watch them. Um, so find all that on Great Pop Culture Debate. WKRP is an awesome song. It is a groove. It's that great 70s. You got the window open in your car. Your hair's flowing. It's a great moment. <laughs> but again, iconic wise, I'm putting Brady Bunch forward. So Dan, are you still Brady Bunch? Yeah, I'm still Brady Bunch. Kate, are you still Brady Bunch? I am, regrettably. <laughs> Amma, are you going to be terribly upset with us if we put through uh, Brady Bunch? I can be swayed here for a very specific reason, and that is Marsha Brady had a celebrity crush of Davy Jones from the Monkeys, so I still get what I want. <laughs> there you go. I love it. <laughs> rationalizing i love it that's perfect so folks that is it for round one we are down to the sweet sitcom 16 do you agree with our picks or do you think we need to book an appointment with dr fraser crane let us know at grapecopculturedebate.com then make sure to come back later this week for part two when the golden girls fresh prince of bel-air the jeffersons and friends enter the fray and we name our best sitcom theme song of all time we'll be there for you like you're there for us too so we'll see you soon 